Hello and welcome back to World 360. Where do Saudi Arabia and Iran stand one year after restoring ties? Why is Russia fuming at France? And why is this US lawmaker making headlines? We answer these and more in today's episode. So first up, Saudi Arabia and Iran. March 10th marked one year since the two regional foes agreed to restore ties under a deal brokered by China. After signing the deal last year, a few high-level exchanges followed, such as the Saudi and Iranian foreign ministers meeting in Tehran last June and the Iranian foreign ministers meeting with Saudi Arabia's crown prince in Riyadh last August. Not to mention Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi's visit to Saudi Arabia last November for a summit on Gaza, which was the first visit by an Iranian president to Saudi Arabia in almost a decade. Though the Palestinian cause has provided the two countries some common ground, analysts say tensions remain between them as they continue to struggle for influence in the Arab world, especially via proxy conflicts such as in Yemen, Syria and Lebanon. Hostility between Saudi Arabia and Iran dates back to the 1979 Iranian Revolution, when the Pehlavi monarchy was toppled by Shiite clerics. Religious differences have only muddied relations. Saudi Arabia views itself as the leading Sunni power, while Iran is a Shiite theocracy. Now, these two countries were also on opposing sides during the 2003 US-led invasion of Iraq. In 2016, they cut off diplomatic ties following a series of events such as the 2015 Saudi-led intervention against Iran-backed Houthis in Yemen, the attack on Saudi diplomatic missions in Iran, as well as Saudi Arabia's beheading of a Shiite cleric, Nimr al-Nimr, in early 2016. But as some experts point out, the two Muslim nations saw cold peace as their best option after years of hostility didn't really serve either of their interests. After agreeing to restore ties last March, it seemed Saudi Arabia got some relief in deterring Iran-backed militias from launching attacks against the kingdom, while Iran got some relief in regard to the regional isolation it has experienced for many years, that too under the weight of Western sanctions. But much has changed since these two Islamic giants agreed to revive ties last year. The Israel-Hamas war is just one such event. If you take a bird's eye view, this war threw a spanner in the works of American officials who had been working towards normalizing ties between Saudi Arabia and Israel. But earlier this year, Saudi Arabia made it very clear that no normalization of ties with Israel could happen without a path to an independent Palestinian state. So in a way, the Palestinian cause has fostered some political cooperation between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And in fact, the Iranian embassy in India confirmed to me that this was the case. And we'll include that report in the description of this video. For our second topic, we're looking at a US lawmaker who you may have recognized sitting next to Kamala Harris during US President Joe Biden's State of Union address earlier this week. I'm talking about the man on the right, Mike Johnson. Now, Mike Johnson is a Republican lawmaker and currently the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, which, as you know, is the lower chamber of the U.S. Congress. Currently, Republicans have a majority in the U.S. House of Representatives, though a very slim one. The upper chamber of the U.S. Congress, which is the Senate, is where Democrats have a majority. So you can understand how and why the passage of bills in the U.S. Congress during Biden's second half of his presidency has been tricky, to say the least. Take, for example, the massive additional aid package for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan. It's been stuck in the U.S. Congress for months, even though it was passed in the Senate. But last month, Mike Johnson, as Speaker of the House, refused to allow a vote on this bill, arguing that first legislation should be passed on securing America's border with Mexico. Keep in mind that this was a bipartisan bill, which means it was supported by both Democrats and Republicans, and was seen as critical for US allies in these conflict zones. Now, in recent developments, the sudden resignation of a US House representative, Ken Buck, has reduced the Republican Party's already narrow majority in the House, which is probably going to make Johnson job all that more difficult. Let's not forget that this has already been a tough road for Johnson, given his predecessor, Kevin McCarthy, was removed as Speaker of the House late last year. This was the first time in US history that the US House of Representatives removed its leader. And more so, it was surprising that eight Republicans voted with Democrats to remove McCarthy. 
So Johnson's rocky beginning has only spelled more disaster for the Republican Party, which is now banking on Donald Trump to win the presidency later this year. Johnson has faced criticism within his own party against his qualifications and age. In fact, U.S. Representative Thomas Massey from the Republican Party said recently that the ouster of McCarthy had been an unmitigated disaster. And just last month, Johnson has said he would like to clean up the mess in his party. After blocking a bill on the foreign aid package, Johnson has now left the door open for US lawmakers to craft an entirely new foreign aid package bill, which this time will probably include restrictions on the US border with Mexico. Pressure is building for the US to provide Ukraine critical aid, especially as Russia has been making some important gains on the battlefield of late, including the capture of Avdivka. Not to mention, there are some players in Europe that are going as far as to suggest sending their own troops to the battlefield. Now, that's a good transition into our final topic, which is about why Russia is upset at France. Just last month, French President Emmanuel Macron sent shockwaves across Europe by raising the possibility that Western soldiers may have to be sent to the battlefield. And this happened right after European players like Germany and Poland said they had no such plans. Macron had said that there was no consensus among European leaders on sending ground troops to Ukraine in an official manner, but that nothing was excluded. He later stood by his remarks and said France would send soldiers if Russia moved to Kiev or Odessa. He has also urged the West not to be cowardly, which sort of reminds of his remarks before travelling to China last year, when he said Europe should restrain becoming America's followers. Macron's comments have clearly shaken up Russia, which is now intent on raising this issue at the United Nations Security Council. In fact, on Saturday, Russia requested a Security Council meeting to discuss Macron's idea to send NATO troops to Ukraine, arguing that such ideas could spell the beginning of the Third World War. Russia had also said on Monday that France's alleged intentions to form a coalition to send troops to Ukraine is a very dangerous line of thought that will only escalate tensions. Let's not forget that during his State of the Union address earlier this week, US President Joe Biden had said no American troops would be sent to the battlefield in Ukraine. Now, after Macron's comment, the French National Assembly approved a bilateral security agreement with Ukraine, which includes promises to deliver more arms, train troops, and send up to $3.2 billion in military aid to Ukraine in 2024. In a recent piece, analyst Nicolas Tenzer writes that Macron has been lackadaisical in his support for Ukraine, but by saying those comments, understood that the message to be sent to Russia had to be urgently quantitative given the dramatic shortage of ammunition and certain weapons among Ukrainian soldiers, but also qualitative. So it wasn't just quantitative, it had to also be qualitative. And something new was needed. Thanks for watching. This is Pia Krishnkuti for The Print.